You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a uh, tape that was made at a Texas Best Seminars in June of this year. That's just last month. It is an incredible uh, tape. Uh, Texas Best Seminars is conducted all over the state of Texas. It's usually a conservative <coughs> audience that uh, attends for these gatherings. And uh, the audiences are large. They're good, decent people. Uh, at this Texas Best Seminar, which took place in Austin, Texas, they invited the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to send a representative to talk to them and then answer questions that the audience had. Well, uh, the uh, portion of the BATF agent's talk is omitted from this tape because we want you to hear the questions and the answers. You're going to hear that these are folks just like you. You will not hear the end of this tape today, so we will continue it tomorrow and possibly the day after until it's finished. But uh, pay attention to the questions and pay attention to the answers. Also notice that the BATF sent someone who uh, is, is uh, not well educated, did not have a good command of the English language, uh, and... Uh, You'll find some of his comments and answers to the questions absolutely astounding. You're also going to hear some of the audience ask some questions that, in my estimation, are pretty, uh, um, pretty dumb. But uh, I'm sure that the people who asked them thought that they were important. Uh, you're also going to hear some very intelligent, very uh, to-the-point uh, questions. And uh, I think you're going to find this, um, this hour and tomorrow's uh, episode of the Hour of the Time uh, extremely interesting at the very least and uh, informative, educating, and eye-opening at the very best. So, take notes if you want, but listen carefully. Uh, my name is Dale Littleton. I'm a senior special agent for the Bureau of Alcohol, Back and Violence, stationed here in Austin. And what I'd like to talk about uh, for about 20, 25 minutes is about ATF. A lot of people do not understand what we are about or what we do. Question. Okay. Line them up. I have a question, sir. Will you answer to this audience yes or no? I have two questions. Are you funded by and do you answer to the Congress of the United Nations? Number two, why is it every time a bomb does go off in a building, federal or whatever, the ATF is right there on the spot and, and, and no access is allowed uh, from anybody else? And then you all subliminally put out, well, it may have been a militia group or anti-government group. Why is that? Okay, the answer to your first question is no. We're not funded by a communist country. The answer to your second question about why we were able to respond so quickly to bombing, and, and, and everybody else put that. Yeah. Okay. I, have, I was part of uh, 1978. I was part of a team that investigated bombing. And then the last five years, I ran the team that would go out and investigate bombings where we had specialized people, where we'd bring in our explosive people, we'd bring in our chemists, we'd bring our agents in. I never excluded any local authorities. They always worked with us. So I don't know where that, where that information came from, but the local authorities do work with us hand in hand, whether it be an arson investigation or bombing. Yes, sir. 
Uh, would you be able to speak on behalf of the ATF? Uh, we hear people who, who uh, make claims that uh, uh, possession of automatic weapons is a viable uh, uh, argument to protect themselves against a tyrannical government. Do you think that's a viable argument? Uh, well, it's you lost bullets. And like I say, there's no, there's no question that you can have those weapons as long as you have, you can pay the tax and you can have them. There's nothing that prohibits you from that. So, uh, and I, really, I don't know if I can really answer your question other than say, if you're not in any prohibited category, such as being a convicted felon, an indictment for felonies, uh, a citizen renouncing his citizenship, a narcotics addict, a person committed to a mental institution by court, dishonored or discharged from the armed forces, or an alien illegally in the country, as long as you're not in those and uh, don't have a misdemeanor charge for uh, family violence type stuff. But as long as you're not in any of those categories, you can have those type of weapons as long as you pay the $200. And today, paying a $200 tax is no problem for anybody. Um, uh, before I ask my questions, I have two questions. I, I, I wasn't clear on an answer you just gave to the gentleman here. He had asked you whether or not the ACF was funded by the Communist United Nations. Your answer was we are not funded by a foreign country. They're not a country. Okay. So. I, I, did, I, I did not, didn't remember. We're not, but as far as I know, we're not funded by the United Nations. Okay, that's okay. what I wanted to hear. Um, first thing I'd like to do is to uh, congratulate your agency on being the second largest revenue generator in the federal government. <laughs> and I will tell you at the outset, that just to be honest, okay, in my own research, my own study, uh, I have come to um, a whole very serious judgment at the behavior and attitude of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Fire. I tell you that at the outset that I am not an unbiased party here. Uh, but I'm willing, I am willing, no, I really, gen no, I mean this, folks. I'm genuinely willing to be wrong about my preconceptions. I have two questions for you based on something that you said. You said that Americans are of a type that, uh, that they do what you tell them they cannot do. You said that earlier on in your uh, speech. I'd like to know where you come off, where the ACF comes off telling Americans who are not harming anybody, who are endowed by their unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, what they can and cannot do. That's my first question. If you yeah, the first question was I was not referring to ACF as being the person who can tell the, United, the people of the United States what they can or cannot do. What I, what I was telling you was that when people, when laws are passed, saying they can't do anything, people decide to do it. I see. Okay, that leads me to my second question. Now, you did indicate that Congress passes a law and we get stuck with it. I'm certain that you're familiar with the Nuremberg trials after World War II in which it was clearly established that I'm only doing my job, I'm only doing what I have been told is not a justification for a violation of the rights of the people under any circumstances, including a time of war. Yes. My question is this. My question is this. If Congress passed a law making murder legal, would you then advocate committing murder? If Congress told you that owning a cat is illegal, would you consider that to give you leave to harass and otherwise arrest and bother American citizens who are doing nothing wrong except owning a cat? In other words, is whatever Congress says automatically going to be enforced by the ATF, or do you have people who will think clearly and say, this does not follow the constitutional protections guaranteeing the rights of the people, and we will not obey this for that reason? The answer to your question is, we have people who realize what the Constitution is and we try to, we will and try to the best of our ability do what the Constitution tells us to. If you had an instruction from Congress to violate right. what you understood was the Constitution, no. would no. you accept no. the instruction? No. Thank you. Yeah. I will say this, let me, let me back up for just one second. Uh, I noticed everybody has, okay, has brought some to attention some of the language that I use. I was born and raised in the country. I said, talk like I'm in the country. And when I say, when I said uh, certain things, I see we're getting very specific on what I say. I am trying to be general in what I'm saying. So please, uh, for all you very intelligent people out there, you will be able to hand, hang me up on language. So bear with me here, and I'll try to explain my way out of it. Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay. 
Uh, sir, I apologize. This is going to be many questions in regard to the Oklahoma City bombing. As far as Carol Howe, the ATF informant at Elohim City who warned you guys at least three weeks in advance, that a racist named Henry Mahon and a German national named Andre Strassmeyer had already caved the Oklahoma Federal Building three times and were planning to blow it up. The fact that the seismographs show at least two blasts ten seconds apart. The fact that many witnesses saw the local police bomb squad there early in the morning securing the area and checking people to come inside. The fact that all the ATF agents and some were even quoted by the local newspapers as saying they were tipped on their pagers not to go to work that day. As far as General Parton, ben K, General Ben K. Parton, former head of Air Force Weapons Development, <coughs> who can prove that there had to have been at least four demolition charges on the third floor inside to destroy those support columns. <coughs> Excuse me, the harassment of Hoppy Heidelberg, one of the original grand jurors who tried to subpoena witnesses who saw John Doe number two. Um, whose life was indirectly threatened and who was dismissed from the grand jury for asking unpopular questions and being refused, he was refused to subpoena witnesses, including the seismograph experts at the U.S. Geological Survey and at the University of Oklahoma. Um, well, I'm sure to explain to us, sir, how a 4,800-pound fertilizer bomb can destroy eight support columns. Thank you. You are, you are the uh, head of the bomb investigation unit, right? You said for the past five years. Mm -hmm. So you were at Oklahoma City no, University? No, I, I said I was not. I was not at oh, Oklahoma. Oh, you were not at Oklahoma. No. Well, with your expertise in explosives, um, could you explain how 4,800 pounds fertilizer bomb could destroy his poor columns? Because General Ben K. Parton, former head of Air Force Weapons Development, says there's not a chance in hell. I'm not going to argue with him. What about Carol Howe, the ATF informant at Oregon City? I've heard. You, uh, you've never heard of Andre Strassmeyer, sir? No. Uh, the informant, I know there's an alleged informant in Tulsa, and I've gotten that from just reading a newspaper, and I, I, don't, I know no more about that than you do. So you guys don't talk about your informants among yourselves at ATF, sir? Not between here and Tulsa, no. Thank you very much for none of your answers, sir. That's a different division. In other words, your office wouldn't handle it. Is it on my, I'm sorry, Mike. I'm sorry, I'm Mike. No, just, just to be clear on that, I mean, would your, would your office handle anything in Oklahoma City or anyone in your no. office? Okay. No. That's I have only people there. Uh, in answer to the one about the, the question about the, I'm trying to go back over, uh, about the column about not coming to the office. Okay. That occurred after. I think it didn't occur at all. I'm going to say it occurred afterwards because we had uh, six people in our office building or in our offices at that time. But I'm not sure what the cover story said. I'm telling you, we had six people in that building at the time it went off. One was in the elevator with the secret service agent. Uh, the, the, other, the other lady... Let him answer the question, Scott. The other, there was another lady in the office and uh, three, another agent and two regulatory people were there in the office. Scott, you, you gotta be on the, you gotta be on the mic, sir. Okay. Afternoon, sir. Huh? I've had the pleasure in the last couple of years to bring the mic closer to you. Get to know some of these branch civilians back here, Catherine Madison and Clyde and Sheila and Grandma Edna. Mm -hmm. I think that I have never met any nicer people in my life. What did they tell y'all on the initial raid about these people? Did they tell you these people were wicked devils in here that you needed to murder these people? What did, what did they tell you to, to go in there with the kind of force y'all did with helicopters and guns and everything to blast them? That's my question to you. Okay. Uh, first off, they didn't tell us uh, to go in blasting, period. Uh, the search warrant was for a compound, the search warrant was for weapons, and they, we knew that the people, there were a lot of people in the place, for the most part, we figured most of the people were innocent people, but were at the location, and our job was to try to serve the search warrant and have no loss of life at, at the time. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you this, do, uh, do you believe in the Constitution of the United States? Yes, sir. Okay. First off, what gives Congress 
the authority to go against that Constitution without going to the American people to give y'all authority to do anything. Because in under the Constitution, we are allowed to bear arms without any asset at all. But yet, they got a house full of idiots up there that takes it up on themselves to make laws without going through the American people, which should be done. Because it's supposed to be for the American people, right? Mm-hmm. To protect them. Well, I don't know my own self, but I ain't given authority to do a, a dang thing up there. Mm-hmm. So, what makes them have a legal right to speak for us without asking us? Uh, the only right reason I can see they have the legal right to speak with us is these people are voted in by the American people to stand up there. Not if voted in by the system. I mean, the president is anyway. Now, you say yourself that you, that you enforce laws, right? Right. Okay, let me ask you this. If you enforce laws, do you in a force, say, somebody that betrays America and American people also? And that has arms. So do what now? Do y'all enforce laws? Say a traitor is betraying everything that America stands for. So a traitor is the is everything. Okay. Do y'all in in enforce laws like that also? Uh, those would be on the sedition laws, and those would be enforced by the FBI. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that. You know, I don't have, we don't have blanket authority like they do. Ours are specifically to certain things. Okay, then, but still yet, what gives y'all the authority to come in on American people? To tell them they can't do this, they can't do that, and they can't buy this, and they can't buy, buy that because they, well, they was in jail, or they might have made a mistake, spent some time. That's bull crap, man. You can't okay. do that. Again, we're back to the, to the Malum, to the Malum uh, Prohibitive Law. Right. We have, there's just as many people that have the opposite view of what you have right there, that everybody, everything should be done to protect them, and what we're doing is what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, but I'm going by the Constitution, but that was set in by everybody. Mm-hmm. If you go against that, you are breaking your own law, man. I hear that, Dale. Dale Littleton. Mr. Littleton, I want to thank you for coming out. I think it took a lot of courage for you to show up here. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, no, you know, Clinton and, and Reno, I, I never heard uh, any kind of apology out of them over Waco, uh, regardless of who shot first. Don't you feel some grief or some sort of an apology for those, what happened to those people? From, from um, Ms. Ms. Reno and the President? No, you, as a, a representative of the ATF, can, can you give us at this time some kind of an apology, maybe not an admi- admission of guilt as to who was right and who was wrong, but can you at least say that you're sorry for what happened to those people? I can be saying I'm sorry for it, but they caused it themselves. Have you seen Waco Rules of Engagement? No, I have not. You need to see it. Uh, Go ahead and give it a look. Okay. But still, so, it's the one that uh, won the Academy Award or yeah, the nominated. Well, let me ask you this. Um, again, thanks for coming out. I, I know how organizations work. You, you can't say I apologize because that's taking a step back. And when you take a step back, that assumes liability. But the one thing that gets me about that is I understand that, that y'all rat, ran out of ammo and the branch division ceased fire and let you walk away with your wounded, and then they end up getting burned out. That did not happen. We still had ammo. Still had ammo. Okay. Well, we still I, had ammo, and everybody had wounded people, and as far as I, I didn't, I, wouldn't, I didn't participate in the peacemaking part of it, but I do know it happened twice. There was a, a ceasefire at one time, and then somebody on their side did not get the word, and it started up again for about 15 minutes, and it finally got around everybody, and it stopped. And at that point, uh, we were able to remove our wounded, and they could have done the same thing. Well, maybe it wouldn't hurt for y'all to have a film to come out to counteract some of this, because I don't want to believe that any government agent, ATF or whoever, is as evil as y'all were portrayed in that deal. Now, I'm not blaming your organization, but that was that was the worst day in American history when that building went up. And, and the Senate... The Somebody just says we're at least sorry for what had happened. I mean, if you don't want to say the bullets came from in or out of the door, whatever, but 
Okay, now another subject while I got you here. You said you're going to investigate arsons. Yes, sir. Have you heard of a, a scheme where they launder money off of arsons via liability claims? Not, not exactly. What, I don't know exactly. It's what it's called that. loss streaming. Instead of income streaming through a t traditional building or, build, or business, they'll load up a site with liability coverage. Uh -huh. And they'll generate the arson of the murders, and they launder the claim. Now, would you be willing to take a look at this to see if you think that it might be happening, and if yeah. you think they'll work to stop yeah. it? If it's, if, it's, if it's arson, yes, it's a violation. Because, because there's all kinds of schemes out there that we probably haven't heard of. Well, well this is one of the worst, and it's called law stream, and I'd like to get some information to you to see if you can stop it. Sure. Thanks. There's, there's two things. He had mentioned something about putting out a videotape of your own. You might, this might be a good time to mention the report you're talking about. And also, too, could you differentiate, because my very limited understanding of what happened at Waco was that there was an initial raid that involved ATF, and then the secondary deal was FBI. And could you maybe right. discuss the difference between the two? Uh, the book he's talking about is investigated through the U.S. printing office. And it's called the investigation of, um, I may not be exactly correct on it, the investigation of Vernon Howe, a.k.a. Uh, David Koresh, in Waco, Texas. I think it's available for 30 or $35. That booklet is a cum accumulation of all the information obtained from the people who were at the scene. Uh, they interviewed all the agents that were on scene. They interviewed supervisors. They took the plan. They took the everything that was uh, the um, affidavit, the search warrant, the search warrant. Everything is in the book. They also go to five or six different experts in different fields, whether it be SWAT training, explosives, uh, intelligence, anything of this nature. They go over, that over and, and they make their uh, they write out what they think of, of what we did. In this report, they are very critical of certain areas where we had failings. They were very they praised in certain areas where we did good. The report, the interesting thing about the report was the report was not generated from outside influences. The report and the investigation was generated by the people, the agents that were at the scene requesting that an investigation be done. First time that I know of that this has happened. And it was done. And if you want to read it, read that book and look at it. And if you've seen the movie, you can make your determination. I have not seen the movie. I know I've read through the book. I know the book. So that's when I was there. So that's it. Uh, would you agree that, that the uh, Waco siege was probably, I, this is not really a question, this is really a statement, was uh, one of the, uh, the most tragic incidents in American history, and that as a result of that, that the people in the United States are doing more than just an administrative explanation as to what, what is going on. Now, I'm coming from a, the position I'm coming from, is uh, a friend of mine, Byron Sage. I'm sure you know Byron. Byron Sage was there, and in one in one, one on one conversation with Byron, he was able to convince me that there that he had done everything humanly possible to end it without a fire. Now, it's my belief that. The only way the truth can ever be known is if there is a hearing, some type of, of uh, a court hearing uh, that's open to the public, that uh, people can attend, that they can see, and that charges are, are placed against agents that, that participated in the event by people uh, that uh, feel like they have been uh, harmed. Now, it's my understanding that the way the law is written now, uh, it conflicts with what, with what our founding fathers wanted. Our founding fathers wanted no man to be above the law, uh, not a judge, not a, an agent. No, no one was to be above the law. And would, you, would, you, would you agree that some type of hearing should be allowed that agents, as well as the, the people that occupy the building, uh, 
should, should possibly be charged and that the people in the United States are entitled to the full truth about what happened at Waco. But that's my question. Okay. Contrary to proper belief, the truth is out there. It has come out. People just don't want to believe it. Well, I mean, the question I, I asked was now, about the court what our nation was set on was law. We were, we were uh, set up under a nation of laws. And what we've got now is we have people in the ATF and the FBI and in, in the legislatures that are claiming to be immune. That's, that's why right. we have these. Okay. Uh, I don't think I'm qualified to answer about the legislatures and people and all this stuff. So, no. Okay. But uh, as far as the book goes, get the book and then uh, see if that corresponds with the same stuff that Brian has, has, has in his uh, your private conversations with him. The, the founding fathers didn't put in there that there would be a book written to explain okay. what the government does. What I would like to see <laughs> is I would like to see the Constitution of hell. You say that you follow the Constitution, mm -hmm. and I think that in your heart you believe you do. Yep. And what I would like to see is some uh, movement in the direction of doing what the Constitution says. And I understand that it's not your decision. Yep. I understand that. It's a lot higher than I am in the federal government. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry to ask you another one here. Yeah, I'll, I'll make this one short. Uh, first thing, um, I think the reason that people keep recommending that you see the rules of engagement is because included is the unedited infrared footage from the FBI plane that was flying overhead uh, on the 19th as the fire was started, where you can plainly see little air-conditioned black dots get out of the back of the tanks and fire fully automatic weapons into the back of the house. That's why people want you to see rules of engagement. The rest of it is irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. The, the FBI is on infrared footage. But actually, my question to you is, uh, your speculation, what would have happened if Jim Cavanaugh and Jack Harwell, the local sheriff, had gone politely with their guns in their holsters and knocked on the front door and said, David, please step outside. We have a search warrant for the premises. Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, the way, uh, I have no idea. And if I could answer that question, I mean, I'm pure speculation. I have no idea. Were any ATF agents in contact with the local authorities before this went down? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, the sheriff's department had actually called us about this stuff, and uh, they they knew they 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 said they wanted some assistance, and, and so we ended up working. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know if you have thought about or considered um, the hazards, the present hazards, and future future hazards of the um, private prison um, private prison um, growing the um, corporation. The private, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Privatization of prisons. Yeah. And how um, these are now, these private prison corporations are now on the stock exchange, and this means more money to build more prisons, which means more money to lobby congressmen to pass more strict laws to fill these prisons for corporations to have more people to work for 23 cents an hour to just like slave labor in China. Have you thought about this? Well, I, have nothing, I, have, I have nothing to do with prisons, period, other than... Uh, yeah, but you are part of this. In a way, you are a part. You are a part of it in a way, if you are helping to put people in these prisons. Most of the privatized prisons are from the state, the state custody, not federal. No, these are private prisons and corporations. Well, I know, but exactly what I'm saying is we have nothing to do with it. That in most of the businesses there, you said we have stuff putting people in jail there. These people are usually there on state charges, not federal charges. But aside from that, we have no, I have nothing to do with prisons, whether it be the state the state prisons or federal prisons. We don't have anything to do with those. Okay, and I can't answer that. In other words, I can't answer that question in terms. Okay, I just would like if you would think about if I can get if you could see the future hazards in all these prisons that are being built and and the. The factories that are being built inside of these prisons. I, I encourage you to, to think about this. Okay. What it may be like ten years from now. I'll, I'll think about it. I, well, no, I, I, don't, I don't mean this the wrong way. I, I think many of these are really, really super valid questions. I just want people to remember here. 
this is a very special a very special guest and a very rare opportunity, okay? Now, I have told him and I have told everybody, I don't want the, necessarily the focus of all his questions to be on Waco. Uh, I, but I would I like to that. But I would, I think it's important that when you have a rare opportunity like this, to stick with questions that either have to do with Waco or areas that he directly deals with. And sure, he has personal opinions on what happens with state prisons. Sure he does. But I'm just saying, do you use this time however you want. But I personally would rather use it to ask him on areas that he's especially privy to, and that has to do with Waco and has to do with firearms laws, explosive laws, alcohol laws, tobacco laws, that sort of thing. But you use it how you see fit. Um, Mr. Littleton, would you tell me again what is your position and your responsibility with the ATF so that I can properly frame my question? I'm a special agent. Senior special agent. Yeah, a senior special agent means you have uh, other agents underneath no. you. No, that just means I've been around a long time. Okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. I just wanted to get that. That's, 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 that's fine. fine. I just wanted to understand that. Um, in, in the first place, I do want to. That just means I've been around a long time. Okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. I just wanted to get that. That's fine. I just wanted to understand that. Um, in, in the first place, I do want to say uh, that I have found that it astonishes me that back, back when George Washington gave his farewell address, he acknowledged that he may have made some mistakes and he was sorry for that. But today we have, within the United States government and its agencies, including the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, exemplary behavior from everybody. Nobody ever admits to doing anything wrong. And I think we're very fortunate to have such good people. But on a more serious point, I want, I want to say again at the outset, okay, I do not recognize the authority of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms on my person. I am a sovereign citizen. I live in this country by grace of God. My law is embodied in the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and my rights are guaranteed and protected by the organic constitution for the United States. Now, having said that, and, and I want you to understand, if an ATF agent came on my property without due process, he would take his life in his hands because he would become a criminal trespasser without due process, and the U.S. Supreme Court has said that I may repel a criminal trespasser any time it happens with necessary force. Now, my question to you, my comment to you is this. You have indicated today here that you do believe in and support the Constitution of the United States. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I would like you to comment on the fact, being a senior agent who has been around for a while, that, and I'll just name a few names, Donald Katona, Ohio, Monique Montgomery, um, who we can go on and on. These are all people who have their homes burst into by ATF agents with absolutely no due process, no search warrant of any kind. Most of them were shot. Some of them were killed. All of them found themselves the victims of what could only be described to the uneducated observer as Nazi stormtrooper tactics. You speak about Waco, and I'm sorry to bring it back in here, but it needs to be said. The original two warrants were for $400 for two handguns suspected of not having had the excise tax paid on them. This justified, in the minds of the ATF, laying siege to a private residence for two months at a cost of a million dollars a day to taxpayers with no benefit of trial, no benefit of charges, the incarceration against their will of men, women, and children in the ultimate, the ultimate death of 86 people and four ATF troopers. I would like to know how you can possibly say that you believe in and support the Constitution for the United States, which prohibits illegal search and seizure, which invalidates House Resolution 666, the Exclusionary Rule Reform Act of 1995, which very simply says that you may not burst into private homes without a search warrant signed by a judge with a complaint and affidavit attached. How can you reconcile the numerous confirmed, knowledgeable sources of ATF raids without due process to your claim that, and I, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to believe you, but I want to hear the reconciliation, your claim that you believe in and support the Constitution, and you still work for the ATF. As far as the search warrant in Waco, the search warrant was for machine guns, and suspected machine guns, and for explosive devices. Where the $400 uh, 
excise tax that you're talking about came from? I have no idea. But Mr. Perez was living in a private residence, minding wait, his wait, own wait, business. Wait, wait, he, he was wait. in a private residence, minding his own business. He did not harm anybody. We had a, we had a search warrant for the, for the location. And who signed the affidavit of complaint attached to the search warrant? The U.S. Magistrate. In, uh, who was a damaged party? Do what? Excuse me. If you would check your constitutional law, you will find a citizen damaged party must sign the complaint, not the U.S. Magistrate. The U.S. Magistrate. No, the U.S. Magistrate signs the warrant, not the, the complaint. The U.S. Magistrate signed the warrant. But not the and complaint. The Who signed executed. the complaint? The warrant was executed. Okay, non-responsive. The question about Donald Carlson, Donald Scott, and the other half dozen individuals who the ATF raided without search warrants. No. That, Thomas? Not, that would not have happened. It has happened. We know for a fact that it's happened. The Los Angeles District Attorney conducted an investigation on Donald Carlson and came to the absolute conclusion that yes, indeed, it did happen. We know for a fact it has happened. My well, question I, to you I, is I do, how you reconcile that behavior with not, your support for the I Constitution. I've seen that. I've never known that to happen. You're saying it's going to happen. I've had to say If you knew it was talking. true, if you knew it was true, would you do anything differently? If I knew If not, you knew that this type of stuff was going on. It's not going to happen discuss. because you're going to have to have a legal search warrant. I understand. Start, what I'm saying is if, if, uh, if you knew for a fact, if, if someone showed you evidence to prove that what I just spoken has and does occur, what would you be those prepared those, to do? If that, if that is in fact happening, those officers need to be tried. And what would you be prepared to do? Me yourself. Yes. In your capacity, yes. would you be, in, in your capacity as a senior agent, what influence or what statements or actions would you be prepared to do if you were to, this was to be brought, uh, brought to your attention as fact? Again, you're talking stuff, you're saying California, Ohio, I'm here in Texas. I, I cannot go uh, all of these places unless I'm sent. Yeah, but okay? let, let's be clear, I brought this up earlier. I mean, I, this is something, and keep in mind, I have my own opinions about what happened at Waco, but, I mean, <laughs> I don't understand how you can really, truly, I mean, yes, you can ask him his personal opinion, that makes sense. But do you really expect an ATF agent in the middle of Texas to know all the goings on of an ATF officer? Not at all. What I do expect is that he does have a personal opinion, and I'm asking him whether or not he is willing to state and for the record what he... Okay. See, if I gave, someone came to me and said... I gave you the answer that that did not ha that would not happen, and I said if somebody did do something, they are doing something illegally, and those people need to go to jail. That's what I told you, and you kept on and on okay. and on. But that I gave wasn't you that clear, and thank you, Mr. Lincoln. You wouldn't want risks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, talk about that. Two quick things. Number one, could you maybe take a moment to tell us why you accepted my invitation to come here today? Just at a personal note, because I haven't asked you that yet. I was kind of... Actually, I was pleasantly surprised that you did accept the invitation. And the second thing is, um, could you maybe tell us, I've heard some people say this, and I would be interested to say, what would be your opinion on what would have happened if somebody within the ACR, not even yourself, just anybody, if they just said, excuse me, I think maybe what we're doing is unconstitutional here, and I don't want to have any personal involvement. If somebody said that, could you maybe speculate on what might have happened? As far as the reason I want to come here is... The reason is everybody, if you go, I'd like to set the record straight. I'd like to tell you where the truth is. I've told you what, what the truth is as I know it. If you do not like that, I'm sorry. If you do not like my answers, I'm sorry. What I am telling you is the truth as far as I know it and some things I'm absolutely positive about. I'm not going to lie to you. With the type of uh, questioning and requesting I've gotten, I don't think some of you believe that. Which I'm, <clears throat> I'm very sorry, but that's the reason I'm here, is to try to tell you the truth. Now, if you don't want to believe it, if you don't want to look at it, then I cannot do anything about that. All I can do is tell you what I'm trying to do. And answer to you, what was the if, if, uh, what, what would have happened? All right, that's the Constitution. Yeah, answer. Somebody gets All right. I, have, somebody. I have been involved in law enforcement for 28 years. Search warrants, you have to have probable cause. If you do not have probable cause, that search warrant does not get signed. It does not get signed by the magistrate. It does not get signed by the judge. It doesn't get signed by a state judge. It does not get signed by a municipal judge. You have to understand that the magistrates in the federal system are lawyers. They are very cognizant of the law, and we have to go a step further 
with them to make sure that, because they're putting their signature on the thing. We have to be truthful. If we lie to them, we're liable. So we have to be truthful. Yes, sir. No, no, no. What, what I'm saying was, what would happen if somebody had said within the ATF, hey, I think maybe what's occurring here might be unconstitutional. Sure, was not they said, I, I, no, but I'm just saying, can you speculate maybe on, on what the ramifications are? I have no idea what would happen. Have you ever heard of an agent no. doing that? No. Okay. I just want to. Because we make it, a, we, we make it opinion, in, in, our, in our opinion, not to violate that. Now, again, other people have their opinions. But according to the law that we operate under, we are not violating the Constitution. And so, yes, ma'am. Who did the cleanup at Waco? Who did the cleanup? Who was responsible for the cleanup at Waco? I have no idea. You, it wasn't you. It wasn't the ATF. I have no idea. Cut. 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 that microphone. You have no idea what happened to the evidence that was never found, like the front door, and you know, I know they put 24 inches. The Texas Rangers, the, the the people who actually did the crime scene, was the Texas Rangers, uh, who were responsible for the cleanup after that, because by uh, to try to make this look as Look at her. To be as fair to everyone, they did not want us to see. There you go again. I'll say one thing. I'll say one thing. I'll say one thing and you take it the wrong way. I'm sorry, I told you that. So please get off my back on that one, okay? If I don't speak out of the one end up. That was one reason we they prior to any of this stuff. The Texas Rangers were going to be assigned the process of processing the scene and working the crime scene. We were not allowed on the crime scene uh, at all until it was the crime scene was worked. The FBI, FBI, uh, crime lab people, and the, and the, the Texas Department of Safety crime lab people came and worked the scene. The Texas Rangers worked the scene. The whole time we were not on, allowed on the scene. The closest an ATF agent could get to the scene. Is just inside the gate. We had a, a portable oh, office set up. So you have no idea who scooped up that 24 inches of top floor well, everywhere no, and started it off? So no, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma uh, if, if somebody did, I'm going to say it was going to be somebody like EPA or so some, some uh, uh, what's the? EPA is good. Uh, EPA is good. Huh? Yeah, Jumpy Office is in charge with that type of stuff. I asked him. He doesn't know what happened to the front door, Mike. Uh, the second thing is, I assume that you that you're regulated by the United States Code. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Title 27. Uh, 26. 26. 26 is IRS. 27. 26 is, is uh, where the where the fines laws come into that deal with machine guns and sawed-off shotguns is in Title 26 and Title 18. And Title 27, which is I don't know what Title 27 is. See. What is Title 27? ATF. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, there may be a regulation part. It could, you talk That's about off the back on firearms. You, you could be talking about the regulations, but the, the laws that we enforce are under Title 18 and Title 26. Okay, so it's my understanding that um, in in the table of parallel values, any code of, federal code of regulations has to correspond to a title. Is that correct? So if it was in Title 26, the corresponding regulation enforcement regulation would be in, in no, in this case, CFR 26. CFR 27 is what you're referring to. The regulations are right. CFR 27 for firearms. The criminal acts are in Title 26. Okay, my question is in 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 Title 26, you have a, a section 5331, which is under that's what they. What section? In Title 26, they send out a notice, 6331, to people okay. called a, a notice of levy. Mm -hmm. The corresponding regulation for that is in Title 27, which, from my study of the code, I find that incompatible. Could you tell me why the, the corresponding enforcement regulation is in CFR 27? Nope. And how it can be enforced when the, no when the statute says it can't no be? Does no that clue. also mean that, that a, ATF would go go attack someone under? No. That notice? And we, we don't attack anybody. We'll start with search warrant. Excuse me. And four? We'll start with search warrant. Okay, thank you. I have to admit that the professional agent is impressive. Uh, and I understand that you've been in the uh, in search for the police Ladies and gentlemen, I have to interrupt right here because what you just heard is absolutely astounding. It's an admission of uh, what we have been trying to tell you for an awful long time. Title 26 United States Code and 26 Code of Federal Regulations are Internal Revenue Service. Title 27 United States Code 
and 27 Code of Federal Regulations are Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. In our research, we have discovered that both of these organizations interchange hats, but that the Internal Revenue Service has no powers whatsoever to levy, seize, enforce, um, audit, uh, inspect your records, books, or anything. All of those codes in Title 26 belong to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and have only to do with alcohol, tobacco, and firearms violations. And you just heard the admission here, and I have never heard that admission before from any government official uh, in, in my whole life. And one of the things we've been trying to do is get the government to admit the truth about these things. Well, this agent just did. He doesn't know what he did, I can assure you, or we, he would not have done it. But anyway, we continue. And if you've been conditioned and trained by the government to do your job and follow the orders that are going down to you, even though they are constitutional, constitutional that you might not be aware of. Is that correct? Right? Yeah, that's what you think. Yeah, that's what okay. you just said. Okay. Right? All right. I'll go along with it. And we do not deny that you believe in the Constitution and every, every man or person who started the crime has a right to trial by jury. Is that correct? Right? Right. And if your agents were, or charged, they'd have a, a right to trial by jury too, right? Yes. But the Brinks and Fedians didn't have that option, did they? Uh, the ones that survived it, yes. The ones that were killed inside the building, didn't they? The ones that killed inside the building stayed inside the building. The reason I know that, I was at the back of the property. I watched it burn. When I say the back of the property, 1,100 yards away. And I watched him stay in the thing and not come out. So you can now do that to call the jury, but I didn't have, I didn't, we, well, there was nothing I could do about it. I was standing back there watching all what was going on. You all, all, you can't say, hey, wait a minute, there was a mess now, we can't stop this. After I was running the deal, I was there as a, it's an ATF deal to start with, right? It was ours to start with. But uh, as soon as the, the, the next day or that afternoon, that's when the FBI was ordered to take over, uh, Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And after that, ATF had no, Further investigative aspect as far as what was going on at the compound after day one. Sure. No. Sure. Sure. Okay. Sure. So, if I've got this correct, y'all started it, they finished. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> I'm honest. Yeah. If, if it was pointed out to you and we convinced you that the Constitution and you're violating it, as an officer of the federal government, would you stop doing it? Yep. Okay. You're on notice. Thank you. Whatever. Hey, I'd like to know, uh, 28 years ago when you took your oath of office to work in the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Administration Agency, who would you take an oath to? Uh, to the Constitution of the United States. When you do it, President? Uh, co worker? Hell, I have no idea. I can't remember right. what the court said at the time. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, this is another incredible admission. He admits that he doesn't even know what the oath that he took is. He just said he doesn't know. He can't remember what it was at the time. He doesn't know where his loyalties lie. And when he originally said to the Constitution, that just came off the top of his head. He doesn't know that. And I'm going to play that back for you. I want you to listen to that. Listen carefully. Hey, listen. I'd like to know... Uh... Twenty-eight years ago, when you took your oath of office to work in the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Administration Agency. Who did you take an oath to? Uh, to the Constitution of the United States. When you do it, President? Uh, co-worker? Hell, I have no idea. I can't remember right. what, the, what it said at the time. Well, I used but to wear a badge. Part of some of the Constitution was part of it. I used to wear a badge. I didn't take an oath to a sheriff, politician, president. State senator or anybody else for that regard, I took that oath to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That meant that if I had to turn to a co worker that is using deadly force illegally, I'm prepared to put a round in his head. I'd like to know if that's the same kind of dedication to your oath that you might have. If someone is the first off to put a round in their head, Yes, gonna have turn, the, turn the clocks off. It's going to have to be involved in deadly force or doing something horrendous. Yes, sir. 
I'd like to know, I'd like to know that uh, uh, there were a lot of reports that came out since that incident in Waco that said that David Perez was seen in the Waco area and that he could have been bagged, stuffed, cut up two days, perhaps a few more days before, and the whole incident there avoided at the home. Now, I'd like to know if you agree with that. Nope. Okay. I'd like to know if you agree with the fact that if you looked out your window, what was he going to be arrested for? He would have picked up for the firearms charges that were warranted by the post to be. How did how the probable cause was based on? He cannot be. Probable cause does not get you arrested unless on, on the search warrant. Uh, I mean, the the arrest warrant. We're going to have to have some some evidence before we're going to get a search warrant. I mean, a arrest warrant to arrest you. Okay, let's just move on here. I'd like to and know you cannot have been arrested before we ran the warrant because there was no no evidence for a warrant to be issued. Wait a minute, you went. You must have had intelligence before us. We yeah, had you didn't get. We had. I'm calls. sorry. We had. I'm not gonna, calls. No. You didn't have intelligence reports 48 hours or less before the incident started to get the warrant. You had intelligence reports that went back probably months on these people. Yes. Yeah. So that was your probable cause right there. Your, your probable cause elements, mm -hmm. you had them before Mr. Koresh was ever approached at his home in Waco. Right. Why wasn't he picked? I had a dream the other night that, well, I didn't understand. A figure walked in through the mist with a flintlock in his hand. His clothes were torn and dirty as he stood there by my bed. He took off his three-cornered hat, and speaking low to me, he said, We fought a revolution to secure our liberty. We wrote the Constitution as a shield from tyranny. For future generations, this legacy we gave. In this, the land of the free home of the brave. The freedoms we secured for you, we hoped you'd always keep. But tyrants labored endlessly while your parents were asleep. Your freedom's gone, your courage lost, you're no more than a slave. In this, the land of the free, and home of the brave. You buy permits to travel and permits to own a gun, permits to start a business or to build a place for one. On land that you believe you own, you pay a yearly rent. Although you have no voice in saying how the money's spent. Your children must attend a school that doesn't educate. And your Christian values can't be taught according to the state. You read about the current news in a regulated press. And you pay a tax you do not owe to please the IRS. Your money is no longer made of silver nor of gold. You trade your wealth for paper so your life can be controlled. You pay for crimes that make our nation turn from God and shame. You take a Satan's number and you trade it in your name. You've given government control to those who do you harm so they could burn down churches and seize the family farm and keep our country deep in debt. Put men of God in jail. Harass your fellow countrymen while corrupted courts prevail. Your public servants don't uphold the solemn oaths they've sworn. And your daughters visit doctors, so their children will be born. Your leaders send artillery and guns to foreign shores, and send your sons to slaughter, fighting other people's wars. Can you regain the freedoms for which we fought and died? Or don't you have the courage or the faith to stand with pride? And are there no more values for which you will fight to save? Or do you wish your children to live in fear? be a slave. Oh, sons of the Republic, arise. Take a stand. Defend the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. Preserve our great Republic and each God-given right. And pray to God to keep the torch of freedom burning bright. As I awoke, he vanished in the mist from whence he came. His words were true. 
We are not free, but we have ourselves to blame. For even now as tyrants trample each God-given right, we only watch and tremble, too afraid to stand and fight. If he stood by your bedside to dream while you were asleep and wondered what remains of the freedoms he fought to keep, what would be your answer if he called out from the grave? Is this still the land of the free and home of the brave? God bless you, and God bless this republic. Yes, Dave, up here on top of this hill, it's still the land of the free and the home of the brave. Ladies and gentlemen, this broadcast will be rebroadcast or rerun in the Round Valley of Arizona at 8 p.m. this evening. So if you have someone that you believe needs to hear it, make sure to tell them to tune in to 101.1 FM at 8 p.m. tonight. Good night, folks. God bless each and every single one of you. I said that uh, up on top of this hill, it's still the land of the free and the home of the brave. I meant it. But something else goes along with that. Right now, at this moment, in this country, we are the only truly free people that exist. The rest of you are enslaved in your own ignorance and your own cowardice.